All right, the numbers are still going up, but let's go ahead and start it off. Uh, welcome to the Energy Resilience Center webinar. Uh, my name is Zach Snyder. I'm a program manager here at the nonprofit Solar Oregon. Uh, we've been around for a while and I'll uh, show you a little bit about what we do in a second. Um, this is a, a very uh, important topic, very exciting topic. Uh, I'm sure it's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, there have been uh, some events in Oregon that have uh, really, I think, increased public awareness about the need for energy resilience. So. Um, Great to be here with you today. Thanks for joining us. We've got two really exciting speakers. Uh, we're gonna be joined by Seth Mullendor, who is the vice president with a nonprofit based in Vermont called Clean Energy Group. And uh, they've been around for a little while and do uh, really great work all across the country. I'll introduce uh, these guys in a little more detail in a second. Uh, we also are going to hear from Jeff Oxnam, who is the founder of American Microgrid Solutions um, and has a lot of experience, uh, uh, executive and technical experience in energy. Um, and uh, both of our speakers are, uh, uh, they work together on projects across the country. Uh, and they're also working with the Energy Trust of Oregon here in our state doing some really exciting work. So. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, our first webinar with Seth and Jeff. Um, we uh, hope to hear more from them as they continue to do their work uh, in uh, Oregon. And uh, so this uh, may be the first in a series of webinars with these guys. Uh, before we get started, just a quick uh, note about uh, Solar Oregon. Like I said, uh, we're a nonprofit. We've been around for four decades in Oregon, uh, educating about clean energy, uh, mostly solar, but also related forms of clean energy. Uh, we have our How to Go Solar uh, workshops, which are uh, all webinars since uh, COVID, but hopefully we'll get back in person soon. Um, we have solar tours. Uh, we also uh, you know, help to create the first solarized campaigns and we continue to do solarized campaigns uh, today. Uh, and we really love to focus on peer-to-peer -peer education. And we often have special topic uh, webinars like uh, this one today. Uh, we are a member-based nonprofit. So thank you to everybody who is on the line who is a member. And if you're not a member and you wanna become one, it's a really great way to support the work that we do. Um, you can go to our website, uh, www.solaroregon.org. Uh, or if you just want to make a donation, you can follow this link bit.ly slash solar donate. And we'll drop those links in the chat. Uh, thanks to everybody who supports the work that we do. Um, this event and many events that Solar Oregon uh, hosts is sponsored by uh, Energy Trust of Oregon. Uh, they have uh, also been around for a while. Uh, do a lot of things uh, related to energy in our state, uh, including providing solar and energy efficiency and other incentives and uh, resources, technical assistance for uh, uh, families, individuals, and organizations across the state. Um, and uh, they are uh, working on some really exciting stuff to do with energy resilience. So thank you so much to Energy Trust for their support. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the first thing is uh, I'm sure all of us are uh, likely pretty familiar with uh, webinars or at least the Zoom platform these days. But um, we've got a couple of tools to, to help make this a little bit more interactive. So uh, we would love to hear all of your questions. We're gonna to try to, and we, we always try to answer all of your questions. Uh, if we have too many, sometimes we'll respond by email afterwards. Um, but uh, to ask a question, please don't put it in the chat, uh, put it in the Q&A function. So you'll see this box right here. Uh, it should be on the bar, probably on the bottom of your screen. Um, and go ahead and type your questions in there. 
and we will answer them when we uh, do our Q&A at the end. Um, the next thing is that we love to do polls. Uh, and uh, this is a great way for us to uh, you know, ask you all a question and uh, get anonymized responses. So uh, it's a good way to get a sense of what you guys are thinking and, and what you are aware of. So uh, I'm gonna start off with our first poll, which is where is uh, everybody joining from? I love to know where our audience is uh, is viewing from. So uh, you should see a few options. Go ahead and select the one that you uh, uh, most that best uh, describes where you are. Looks like we've got about 80, 80 90% voted already. You guys are quick. Um, just give it another. Oh, it went back down to 88. Someone unvoted. I didn't know you could do that. Um, all right, yeah, so uh, it looks like we've got most of our audience from Portland metro area, um, but a couple of out of state uh, or international, which is always, always fun. Um, the, uh, so that's, that's uh, all for our housekeeping. Let's go ahead and dive into our topic today. Um, I'm, uh, I'm super excited about this. I talk a lot about energy resilience. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the term energy resilience. So uh, I'm gonna bombard you with another poll right now, which is how familiar are you um, with this concept? Basically, um, what we're talking about is uh, when the power goes out, uh, do you still have the ability to have power in your home or in a community center or uh, for any organization? Um, great. I'm just going to give one more second here. All right. Um, looks like we got a fair spread, which is good. So uh, I'm not going to talk too much because uh, about this because Seth is going to start us off with uh, some great content on why energy resilience is important and why you should be thinking about it. Um, but energy resilience uh, uh, centers, whether this is you know a home or a, a community center uh, or a multifamily you know housing complex. Um, it, you use energy technologies, for example, solar and storage is a key energy resilience strategy. Um, and uh, this can make a huge difference when there is a power outage. And uh, I think there have been long periods of time in my life, just speaking personally, when uh, I have not been very aware of the need for energy resilience because I've more or less had you know, uh, consistent energy uh, however, th this past year in particular has uh, provided a couple of opportunities for us to learn the value of energy resilience uh, in Oregon firsthand. Um, and one of those was the really devastating wildfire season that we had. Um, and uh, there were some communities uh, where the power was switched off uh, preventatively during a strong windstorm. Um, also, uh, we had a, a really intense snowstorm and there were large uh, portions of the state that were without power. Um, and uh, personally, I lost power for three days and it was in my home and I tried to migrate to my office. Uh, luckily that was on a Saturday, Sunday and Monday, but um, on the Monday, I uh, you know tried to go in the office and the power went off in the office too. Um, and I definitely, that was the longest outage I've experienced personally. Uh, my refrigerator wasn't working and I ran out of food and I was having a hard time even finding food for myself. Um, so uh, I definitely learned a lot there and I've got uh, one last poll I am going to share before we launch into our, um, oh, sorry, I had that last poll up, didn't I? It was in your face. Um, 
uh, before we launch into our presentations, and that is, have you experienced a multi-day power outage in the past year? Yes, no, uh, or maybe a shorter outage. So I'll give a second for that. All right. It looks like uh, almost a third of us have had a multi-day power outage in the past year, um, which is, I think, more than I was expecting. And that 25% on top of that have had shorter power outages. So uh, I think we're all ready to learn about uh, energy resilience centers. So I am going to um, introduce our, oh, sorry, one more slide, very important slide before we uh, I introduce our speakers. And that is that, um, you know, uh, solar plus storage, like I mentioned, is a great, uh, the key energy resilience uh, strategy. And it is available for homeowners, for business owners, uh, also for larger community centers, which we're, we're going to be talking about those larger centers today. But if you are interested uh, in any of those types of projects, um, you should know that Energy Trust of Oregon uh, is, provides great resources. They have a solar uh, development assistance incentive, which is up to $1,800. This is just for the larger community center type of uh, resilience project. Uh, and that is to help you uh, plan out and do initial site feasibility for uh, a project. Uh, Energy Trust also has great solar incentives. There are other incentives. Uh, that apply to solar and or batteries. Uh, that includes a federal incentive and a state um, uh, solar plus storage rebate. Uh, and Energy Trust also has uh, an amazing uh, network of contractors that they can refer you to uh, to get started in, and to start to uh, plan out a project. So uh, a great first step uh, for any type of project is to go to energytrust.org slash solar bid. And uh, we'll drop that link in the chat and you'll find more resources there. So without further ado, I would love to introduce Seth Mullendor. Um, so Seth is vice president and project director for Clean Energy Group, overseeing projects ranging from uh, customer sited solar and battery storage to the replacement of power plants with clean technologies. Seth works with policymakers, project developers, industry, advocates, and community and, and environmental justice groups to advance clean energy policies and projects with a focus on achieving greater access to solar and battery storage technologies for disadvantaged communities. Much of his work pertains to the uh, research and reporting of energy storage technologies, policies, and supporting market structures. Prior to joining Clean Energy Group, Seth served as a Sustainable Energy Fellow with Union of Concerned Scientists and worked with Maine Clean Communities to help advance clean transportation initiatives. Seth holds a uh, Master's of Science in Civil and en Environmental Engineering from Stanford University and a, ba a Bachelor's of Science in Geosciences from the University of Southern Maine. I am going to uh, exit my screen sharing and then Seth you should be able to um, start up uh, sharing your screen if you have oh here we go I have to give you permission there we go okay great uh, let me get that up now uh, it's not showing me the one that I want one second so yeah great to be here today um, thanks for that introduction Zach and um, it's not showing me what I want one moment. I'm going to start off just showing, uh, telling you a little bit more about, there we go, Clean Energy Group and who we are. Um, but I'm going to give it, it an intro. Everybody okay, should be able to see my slides now. So, uh, Clean Energy Group, we're, we're a uh, national nonprofit. Um, I am based in Vermont, as a lot of our staff is, but we work all across the country. I've been in the clean energy space for about 
20 years, a little over that. And over the last eight years, we've been very focused on solar paired with energy storage for resiliency applications. Um, we are funded by a number of foundations for our work. And one of our big projects is the Resilient Power Project, which is what I'm gonna talk a lot about with you all today. Um, through that effort, uh, Clean Energy Group has, has had the opportunity to work with more than 200 facilities across the country, helping them with um, facilitating the, the evaluation of solar and storage for community-based facilities. Uh, we started this work about eight years ago after Superstorm Sandy uh, left much of the, the Northeast disabled without power and um, the realization that one, uh, traditional sources of backup power diesel generators um, failed uh, in mass um, to a large extent for a number of reasons, and that uh, communities that were, were least able to respond to and recover from the outages of low-income communities and uh, historically uh, underserved communities, communities of color, were hit hardest by the outages. So the Resilient Power Project works to facilitate development of a more equitable distribution of solar and storage primarily for energy resilience, also for economic benefits and wealth creation among low-income communities, communities of color, and historically underserved communities. Um, so we worked all across the country. You can see from the map, I'll show you another map of, of where all our projects have been we worked on. Um, we, we provide in-house expertise as well as uh, small technical assistance grants to engage engineering support. Folks like American Microgrid, uh, Jeff's company, their go-to provider for the technical assistance. And we've done a bunch of projects with them. Uh, we've we've uh, deployed more than 80 technical assistance grants, um, almost uh, well, over $800,000 in, in grants we put out there. We're getting close to a million now um, to uh, probably 50 nonprofits uh, at this point. We work a lot with affordable housing developers, community-based organizations, and municipalities that are looking to do uh, solar and storage for community facilities. Here's a map of projects that we've helped support uh, evaluation. A number of these have gone forward. A lot don't, but it's always a learning process along the way. Um, and a, a number of them are in different stages of development. A few projects highlighted. I'm not going to get into all these here. I'll show you a few projects later on in the slides, but this gives you a sense of where, where we work. You can see there's still a lot in the Northeast, but um, pretty well geographically diversified as far as where we've been doing work. Um, increasingly getting more into the Southeast, um, the Southwest and, and the Midwest. So I was asked to, to give some of the why of energy resilience. Zach already presented some of this, but I've got a few headlines here just to talk about some things from the past few years that have been big events. Most recently were the outages in Texas where all of uh, ERCOT, the, the ISO for Texas was Pretty well disabled, 70% um, of customers lost power, most of them for multiple days. Um, there were difficulties for people accessing water um, because they weren't able to um, have power for, for water pumps and there were freezing problems. Uh, all sorts of, of, of issues happened in, in Texas. A lot to do with gas power plants not being able to deliver the power that they needed. Um, and we've had a lot of interest from Texas since that storm in, in local energy resilience with solar and storage. Uh, from 2019, uh, Zach mentioned wildfires, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric shut off power just in one event to uh, about 2 million people. And a lot of folks were not well uh, prepared for those outages. A lot of people were not informed that they were coming. Um, and there were many stories in the wake of that of people, particularly folks that have electricity dependent medical needs that were adversely impacted by that storm. Um, some very scary cases where, where, where people were put in, in jeopardy for not being able to have their normal medical routine in place, not to mention food loss, lack of access to food. Um, and accompanying all of these outages, there's usually a spike in carbon monoxide poisonings due to improper uh, use of, of generators. Uh, and this was the big one, uh, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico left all of Puerto Rico in the dark, some of them for almost a year, actually some for over a year. Most people were back within a year, uh, but it took almost a year to bring back power to the majority of folks. To this day, uh, people are still struggling, struggling with power supply there. Uh, we work with folks on the island of Vieques, um, 
which is, uh, is off the coast of the main island of Puerto Rico, they still have periodic power outages and has not back to where it has been. Um, Puerto Rico in some sense is its own case, but this can happen in a lot of places. What most of you are probably familiar with is the big one for your area, Cascadia Subduction Zone. Um, this uh, article came out in the New Yorker, and we started getting a lot of calls from the Pacific Northwest about energy resilience and the need for a couple of weeks of power. I know that's work at Energy Trust of Oregon is working on right now, and uh, we're helping support that, and, and, and Jeff and his team are, are doing analysis on that. So the reason that folks are looking towards solar and storage is fuel supplies are expected to be disrupted in an outage of this magnitude as well. Um, gas lines are not, uh, not expected to be intact and supplies of, of diesel fuel are, are expected to be quite disrupted. And so you need something locally that's able to provide power. Uh, all of this has led to a real increase in interest for solar paired with battery storage. This report just came out, I think, last week or the week before from Energy Sage and uh, North American Board for Certified Energy Practitioners, looking at uh, trends in storage adoption uh, paired with energy, paired with solar. And you can see since 2017, um, the interest in pairing storage was about 30%. Now it's up to 40% for solar installations and the actual attachment rate was only 7% in 2017 and now it's up to 20%. So one out of every five solar systems going in right now, this is both residential and commercial, are including energy storage. You can see some of the places that I just talked about in the, uh, the charts below, California, um, we're, we're up to a quarter of systems that are being installed with, with batteries right now. Puerto Rico, almost 100%. Prior to Maria, there were very few energy storage systems in Puerto Rico. Now, nobody, pretty much nobody is installing solar anymore without batteries. It's just a point of practice. If you're putting solar in, you put energy storage in as well. Um, the driver of this, this is in that same report, the primary driver for storage uh, increased attachment rates overwhelmingly is resilience. 65%, um, the main reason for exploring battery storage is resilience. Um, that's again, a big increase over 2019 when it was just 45% of products were driven by, by resilience. That is the main driving factor. Um, I didn't list the barriers here, uh, but probably most of you could guess that um, batteries are too expensive is the main barrier. 76% uh, of respondents said that batteries being too expensive was the biggest barrier. Uh, second to that was that there are not enough incentives for energy storage, which is very much a similar thing, but even that it was only 33% of respondents. So batteries cost too much is the biggest thing. So the attachment rates, they're being driven by people's interest in energy resilience, less than economics. Uh, this is a slide that a few years ago, we worked with the, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, looking at case studies for valuing energy resilience. So the problem is that we all know that if there is value to having backup power that can range from, you know, what a household saves on spoiled food if they don't have refrigeration um, to medical emergencies, if they are depending on electricity for, for medicine, um, to things like data centers, where if they have a blip in their energy loss, they can lose millions of dollars worth of, of revenue for that. And manufacturing is similar. This looked at community facilities. Um, I won't spend too much time here, but just, just an example. Uh, this is looking at in, in California, in Anaheim, um, at a primary school, if you were just to look at economics alone, uh, they would install a PV system, a fairly good sized PV system. If you value resilience, then the solar gets a little bit bigger. Um, and oh, so they would have a small battery as well to, to manage demand charges at the school. Um, but if you value resilience, you get a much bigger battery. Uh, it's even more stark for the, a large hotel example where without valuing resilience, um, they would not install solar or storage. And when you put a value on resilience based off of how long duration outages are and, and assigning the value to, to that outages, which um, there's a, a tool called the interruption cost estimator that can do that for different areas. Um, they got a big solar system and a fairly sizable battery as well, um, resulting in a, in a good net present value for the system. 
Now, we all, that doesn't mean it's any easier to monetize. It just means that there is a value there. Uh, I wanted to uh, show a few examples of projects that have been uh, have moved forward that we've worked on for energy resilience. Just to give you an example of you know, what what issues were they facing and what kind of systems did they end up installing? We mainly work with uh, commercial community facilities. Um, this was one of the few residential scale projects that we work with. Uh, this is a project in Vermont called McKnight Lane. It's a, a redevelopment of a defunct mobile home park that was redeveloped as net zero uh, affordable rental housing. Um, uh, so all of these are, are modular homes that were built to net zero standards. So they had solar, uh, but there was no energy storage in the projects. Uh, we were able to work with a uh, utility here, Green Mountain Power, and a foundation to provide some extra support to get uh, sawn-in batteries in, in each one of these units. Those are six kilowatt hour batteries that back up lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, refrigeration, basically everything you need to have running in an outage situation for this, this project. Um, working with the utility helped to lower the cost of the system. They tap into these batteries as well as a lot of other batteries in Vermont uh, for peak demand events, their annual the peak for, for the regional peak um, to lower those and monthly peaks as well. And that provides them with value. So they pass that along into um, an upfront rebate for, for the storage projects in this, in this project. And then foundation support was able to kick in for the rest. Uh, this is a project we worked on with American Microgrid in New Mexico. This is the Cimarron Forestry Office. Oh, I should say in the McKnight Lane, you know, what we're dealing with in Vermont a lot is snowstorms, ice storms, and wind, um, like what the recent event you had in, in, in Portland area. So that was what they were working on, on dealing with there. In um, New Mexico, that was not the problem they were dealing with. They were dealing with fires. Um, this is a remote uh, forestry office that manages a big region of the state, uh, a very um, impoverished region. Um, they had frequent outages. And when they have an outage, it's usually due to a fire that shuts off roads as well. So they were not able to get um, fuel for, for the generator they had there. Uh, so the solution they ended up putting on was, was 10 kilowatts of solar and, and 16 kilowatt hours of energy storage. Um, and that would be able to power a lot of essential services for them, pumping, water pumping, lighting, communications, charging, doors, computers, and kitchen area. Um, they still have a generator there as well, um, but the solar and storage can support all of that on its own or in conjunction with the generator. The last one I'm going to show, this is from Puerto Rico. This is uh, Clinica IEA. This is a community health clinic in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, we worked with a, another nonprofit called Direct Relief. They, they provide um, a lot of medication and services to folks in the, in the wake of, of disasters. They were spending all of their money on diesel fuel in Puerto Rico and said, this is crazy. There's got to be a better way. So they started putting small or relatively small solar and storage systems at medical facilities to be able to power at least refrigeration to keep vaccines cool. Uh, so this is one of those systems there in Puerto Rico. Um, that's actually me visiting that site um, on one of the trips I took to Puerto Rico. They've been able to do a number of clinics across the island um, for, for energy resilience, uh, for, for vaccines and power pull facilities in some cases. I uh, want to close out just with this resource that uh, Clean Energy Group put together. It's available for free on our website. Um, and always feel free to contact me if you have questions. Uh, this was based on questions. That we received over 100 questions from stakeholders about solar and storage. And we put this out to try to create a foundation of knowledge for folks that were just getting started. So this may be a good resource for some folks that are, are less familiar with solar and storage at this point. Uh, here's my contact information. Which is Seth at CleaningGroup.com and uh, org. All right. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. And I will turn things over to Jeff. Great, Seth. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really cool to see what you guys are working on and uh, see some of those projects. Uh, I think it's it's always great to um, to you know hear what the impact is on an individual scale. Um, so I, uh, would love to introduce now, uh, Jeff Oxnam, uh, and from American Microgrid Solutions and, uh, Jeff, I'm going to give you a full introduction here. Um, if that's all right. 
Uh, and so Jeff is a microgrid project developer and former utility executive with more than two decades of experience in energy, utilities, telecommunications, and infrastructure. Uh, he has managed strategic planning, operations, marketing, and communications efforts for those uh, industries and environmental organizations as well. Jeff founded American Microgrid Solutions in 2016 and has grown the company through dozens of microgrid analyses and development projects in 18 states and territories. He earned a, a BA in history from Williams College and an MBA from the Johns Hopkins University Cary Business School. And uh, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan has appointed Jeff to chair the Maryland Clean Energy Center Board of Directors. Uh, so super excited to have Jeff here and uh, go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks Zach. Hey, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today and, and talk to you about the work. Um, so great to be presenting with Seth uh, Mullendore and the folks at Clean Energy Group. We've been working here at American Microgrid Solutions for, um, gosh, we were about five years now with Clean Energy Group all over the country and it's been fantastic. And I think one of the most exciting projects that we have done in that span is the work that we're now doing in Oregon to look at um, resilient power solutions <clears throat> and microgrid solutions throughout the state. And um, I wanna start, uh, start off with a, with a huge shout out to Jenny Hall and the Energy Trust um, folks. Uh, working with Jenny has been fantastic and she has a real passion for expanding uh, the benefits of so not only solar, but uh, solar and storage uh, throughout the state. So very excited to do that. Really appreciate the opportunity to, to work with um, the Bonneville Environmental Fund and uh, Thomas Endicott and, and the crew over there. Um, and, and again, most importantly, with all the communities that we've had a chance to, um, to get involved with throughout the state as we've worked on um, this project. So um, our involvement in, uh, in Oregon is not just about the big one. Uh, we talk about the Cascadia subduction zone as being sort of the design criteria and that makes uh, Oregon, one of the most aggressive resilience cases in the country. Uh, depending on where we are, we might be looking at setting up resilient power solutions for uh, to survive hurricanes or to survive ice storms uh, and wildfires. But the Cascadia subduction zone and Oregon's two-week preparedness goal creates a whole new sort of level to that. Interestingly, other states and other organizations are looking at that two weeks and saying, hmm, that is a, uh, that is a pretty compelling target. Um, and we've seen uh, certainly in uh, the Department of Defense and, and elsewhere looking at, at longer tool, uh, uh, outages. But it isn't in our book when we talk about resilience just about what happens when the lights go out. Resilience is really what a community does 24-7, 365 to stay healthy, vibrant, and growing. And we take that very seriously, even in the technical design of uh, solar and storage systems. That resilience approach says that a system should be there to provide backup power, but should also provide benefits on bluebird days when everything is fine. That's gonna be pretty important. We'll talk a little bit uh, further about that as we go along. Our work in Oregon's really got three phases. We're working uh, and we're in the midst of it. So um, I'm gonna tease some parts of what we're doing and, and answer questions about uh, you know, whatever you all would like to chat about. But um, <clears throat> we're in the middle of the project. We are working on 20 plus different sites around the state where we're looking at doing uh, feasibility analyses and designs of uh, renewable power systems. These facilities represent a number of different use cases, everything from multifamily housing to schools to public safety. Um, with, the, uh, with the intention that hopefully where they make sense, these facilities will then go and uh, pursue a, a microgrid or a resilient power solution. We're then looking at sort of the big picture. 
What do these use cases tell us about what works and what the challenges are throughout the state in terms of expanding resilient power systems designed to hit these, uh, this two week goal. Um, and then third, we're hoping to build all of that understanding and analysis into tools that are useful for everyone. Whether you are a community organization looking to deploy a system or you are a uh, solar or storage developer uh, or installer and trying to uh, enhance how you can deliver those services or any one of the number of stakeholders that are involved in the project. How are we going about this? We're doing a techno-economic feasibility analysis, and that's a grandiose way of saying we are taking a look at all the different scenarios and configurations of systems that might work on a site, running them through models to tweak sizing, um, to look at different components and different dispatch to find the ones that really fit, and then figuring out how much do they cost today and what will they cost over the life cycle of the project? Um, that touches on really sort of the big components, but when you think about it from a facility standpoint, they have three key goals that they're really trying to achieve. One, security or what we'll call what we call resilience, right? They want to make sure that the lights can stay on. Um, two, savings. Ideally, this will be a cost-effective solution and in some places um, actually generate a lower cost of uh, operating your facility on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then sustainability, um, very much trying to integrate a lower impact, uh, cleaner, more efficient way to, to um, run the system. I won't spend too much because uh, thanks to Zach's really cool poll at the beginning of this, we do have a, uh, a pretty knowledgeable audience and, and I'm more interested in hearing your questions and your thoughts than, than uh, telling you what you probably already know. But very quickly, when we talk about microgrids or hybrid power systems, and I'm gonna, for, for the truly in the weeds, Inside baseball folks, I am I'm going to be a little bit liberal with definitions today just to keep things easy um, when we talk about microgrids versus hybrid power systems. But in general, we're talking about systems that utilize a number of different generation and storage assets. And typically, if it's a microgrid, work with multiple different buildings or facilities uh, that come together. And they can all they are all interconnected with the grid during normal connection, uh, during normal conditions. But if there's a power outage, they can operate independent from the grid. We get into the nuance when you talk about whether you're behind the meter or multiple sites. Again, we're, I think we'll, we'll focus on the resilience aspects instead. But the important piece here is that there are a lot of components that have to come together. As I said earlier, in normal conditions, everything's running fine. You take a microgrid or a hybrid power system or a resilient power system, and you try to make them, you optimize them for the most uh, cost-effective way to run. You also look to optimize them for their maximum sustainability benefits. When there is a power outage, you want to make sure that you can run either that facility that you're that you're sited on or that portion of the facility, those critical loads that are key to keeping going and delivering your value or mission to the community. Now, before we dump, jump into the, the power side itself, I wanna take just a quick second to talk about um, resilient energy in context. At the end of the day, this is all about people and serving people and continuing missions. So when we look at a facility, a building, a, a, a campus or whatever, and we think about what its mission is, power is only one component. 
and the good folks over at the Ur Urban Sustainability Directors Network, who are really some of the pioneers in this resilience hub concept, have said, look, there's five things you got to think about. Yeah, power is one of them, and you see it there as number three, but there's also resilient programming and services. What is that facility doing to take care of the community along the way? Resilient structures. Is this facility going to withstand what the, the condition that caused the outage in the first place itself? Communications. You can have power, but if you can't communicate with folks, you're going to have troubles being effective. And then operations. The personnel and processes necessary to operate the facility. Contextualizing that and power's role in it, I think, is important. So we, you know, reiterating, consider as you're looking at a project, resilience in the community context, what does the community need to be resilient? And then in the facility context, what does the facility need overall, not just its operations? One of the first and most important tasks we do when we go in and we look at any one of these sites is to understand the facility's mission and operations. What services do they deliver? And do they expect to deliver in an outage? That gets us into the goals and constraints during three conditions, normal operations, outage, or that recovery period after the outage that may, as we can remember from some of these major events, be lengthy and not have full power back to the community. When we then get into the facility and its specific needs, we need to understand key pieces like what utility tariffs is it subject to? Because that's gonna drive the economics. What does the load profile look like? How does it use energy during the day? And, not, and, and most importantly, you wanna look at it on an hour by hour basis throughout the year. That changes and you wanna make sure your resilient power solution is able to handle it. What are the critical loads? Again, a facility may not need all of its operations in order to keep going. A resilient energy center or a resilience hub probably does because it is serving the community particularly hard when, when there's an outage. Seth mentioned the Cimarron facility that's there you know, during forest fires. It's gotta be up and running even when everything else around it isn't. So what are those critical loads? And then how long is the outage that we wanna be able to sustain? That duration, as we said, in the, in the work we're doing in Oregon is 14 days. That's a fairly exceptional case. I'll tell you some neat things that we've learned already. One, when you focus on a resilience-driven solution instead of, say, some of the economic solutions, solar becomes more important than ever in the mix. The old solution used to be throw a generator in the backyard, and if there's an outage, turn it on. That's not going to help you enough, given the typical designs across that long duration outage. But when you bring in solar and storage, suddenly there is a dramatic impact that can help stretch that. Likewise, if people, its facilities are continuing to use conventional solutions, the solar and storage makes those solutions far more effective. How did we go about doing this? Well, we, as I said, we, we looked at each facility, explored a trade space of solar, battery, and other configurations. Then we identified solutions that would meet our resilience needs. Um, that's that two-week outage. And we decided in uh, this, a um, setting a uh, confidence interval or probability that the system will be able to last that full two weeks. There's a lot of different approaches to setting that resilience threshold. We can talk a little bit more about them, um, but that was a standard to, um, to start the work on. Sorry. I won't spend much time here. Um, I think we're all aware of what the value of having solar and storage and battery during a typical day does. Um, that black line would be what you would normally be demanding off the grid if you didn't have solar and storage. Um, when you look at the yellow and the green, there's your solar going to work for you and uh, your battery 
gobbling up the solar your facility doesn't need and then using it later on so that you're offsetting a lot of what you'd need from the grid. Part of what we do is, is running all of the scenarios to see what the optimal sizing of all those pieces coming together would be. One of the key take homes is that resilience is not the same all year long. Different times of the year will pose different challenges when you're integrating solar and storage and other assets into a system. So that's a, that's a primary design challenge that we have to face. What this little heat map shows you, purple is where um, those times of the year where a system can be expected, a solar plus storage system could be expected to run without interruption for 14 days straight. And as you can imagine, summertime, that's great. This system as designed would do that just fine. But then you see those yellow and green segments out at the edges of the year. That's where it's more challenging to get into uh, being able to predict that you will be able to run the system all the way on solar and storage alone. So what we do is we optimize and, and, and develop a system that'll be able to cover those periods where the probability starts to sink down or have the facility look at strategies like load shedding that might help it be more successful in those periods. What you're looking at here is really a model of power outages being run every hour of a year uh, in a obviously in a, in, in a model solution using solar plus storage or whatever assets we want to put together. And we run all 8,760 of those um, power outages to see how much survivability there will be. Adding solar and storage greatly extends that and gives us a lot more opportunity. Here's another look. In a conventional strategy, if a facility, in this case, had a, an old 50 kW generator that it was living off of, a diesel generator, at about the end of three days, it would be out of luck. Um, not to mention that conventional generators have a pretty checkered uh, past in terms of their um, reliability during events. But what happens if you add solar and storage to that and you're trying to stretch out over the period? Now the yellow shows you how much longer the solar and storage can go. It really just stretches that asset you already have and you only wanna use in, in backup situations. Plus what that gray bar, what that generator can't do for you that the solar and storage can is bring those sustainability benefits and those economic benefits. So those were some of the key um, moments that we've seen in the work in um, Oregon. Solar and storage, when you're looking at resilience-driven solutions are more critical than ever to achieve those longer durations that we expect. Um, and even in places where they have more conventional strategies, by bringing in solar and storage in, we can effectively increase the probability of making that 14 day event. Um, Zap touched on something that's absolutely critical too, and, and I'll drop there, but when we start to value resilience and put a monetary value on it, suddenly the equations change not just from how long we survive, but also from the economics of systems. Seth used the example of a data center. A data center has no problem telling you down to the nanosecond what an outage is worth. Not a lot of facilities do that until after there's a problem, until after they've realized the cost of the outage and the lack of resilience. That's a, 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 a frontier that folks like the Clean Energy Group are really pushing us all as it, to, to better understand and better quantify and help to better define and optimize these systems. So with that, I'll, 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 I'll pause and again, thank um, Zach and Jenny and the, um, 
Energy Trust folks for the opportunity to be working throughout the state. And I look forward to hearing your questions and, and, and meeting uh, you all as we, uh, as we continue along our way. Jeff, thanks so much uh, for that presentation. That was really great. A uh, huge thanks to both Seth and Jeff. Um, it's uh, obvious that the, the work that you guys are doing and the work that Energy Trust of Oregon is doing is gonna have a huge benefit for communities across the state. Um, and I think uh, everybody knows that uh, how valuable that is. So, so thank you guys a lot. Uh, we're gonna do uh, a Q and A session now. We've got uh, plenty of great questions on the Q and A. Uh, if you have a question and you are thinking uh, that it might be a good question or you think it might be a, a stupid question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A box anyway. Um, we'd love to hear it. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get through all questions, uh, but I want to ask Seth and Jeff, uh, what, and uh, Jeff, you can go ahead and, and stop your share now. Um, uh, Seth and Jeff, do you guys have to run uh, right at one o'clock? I know that we scheduled this until one, but um, I can hang around a bit. Okay, great. Yeah, well, I would love to pick your brain as well. So um, let's get started. We've got a number of questions uh, here, uh, Seth, from your presentation. Uh, the first one is from uh, Shanna, and the question is, are grants uh, only given to nonprofits or community-based organizations or can municipalities also qualify? Yeah, I, I assume this is in reference to our, our technical assistance fund grant that, that Clean Energy Group um, manages. And so it is open to, to municipalities. Um, so, and, and even some for-profit companies, we've worked with some for-profit affordable housing providers, but typically it is nonprofits. But we, we certainly work with a lot of municipalities through that program. Great. Um, and I think uh, we've got, uh, had an answer, uh, a pretty thorough answer from Jeff here. Uh, someone asked, what are the Oregon projects? Um, and I, unless you guys have anything else you want to add on there, uh, I think you guys have gone over uh, plenty on that. Yeah, we did have another project in, in Eugene uh, with, with the Eugene water um, project that um, does water pumping as well. But, but yeah, the majority of the work has been with Energy Trust and uh, in and around the Portland area. Fantastic. Um, so Alan asks, what technologies other than batteries have been used for storage? Which is a great, interesting question. Yeah, oh, Pretty open question. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, it depends on the application, right? And Jeff, you can, I'm sure, speak to this more than I can. You know, uh, there are a number of different technologies that can do storage. Things like flywheels. Um, there's even heat storage through, through water heaters. Um, but that's not, those are not gonna provide you resilience, although there are some flywheel projects, but um, generally batteries are the go-to. I do say fuel cells are probably the thing I see most often for, for storage after that. Um, but those are the main ones. I Jeff, jump in here. Yeah, I, I, you know, speaking just from the industry, generally, uh, you know, as Seth indicated, there's a wide range of technologies, some old, some new. Um, even pumped hydro, a lot of communities have, have used that um, where you, you know, fill a tank during the day and then let it run down at night to, to give you some generation. Um, almost all of our, well, I would say all of our work right now is focused on batteries being the primary um, storage um, strategy. And, but we do look at a diversity of chemistries and configurations in the batteries. Great. Um, so uh, there's a question here from Hal. Uh, with a low avoided cost of electricity in Oregon and still expensive batteries, uh, microgrids are a niche market. How can funding be braided? Um, and maybe this, this is also maybe a kind of an open question, but, and of course, I think it's probably different in different areas, right? But is there, are there any generalities on, on how many types of of funding sources you get for projects? Yeah, so that's a great question. I really like the expression braided. Um, I sometimes use the uh, the term Franken finance, 
um, cause you end up pulling uh, all sorts of different um, sources depending on where you are. Uh, you know, looking at a national standpoint, uh, you know, different states have different programs either directly targeted at um, resilience or indirectly benefiting resilience. Uh, and I'm, I think we're hopeful and I know CEG works hard towards promoting some of these that are, that are truly effective. In Oregon itself, um, yeah, it is, uh, it, it is challenging with the low cost of power to do the same thing you could do in say uh, Hawaii or Massachusetts or some other places where power is much more expensive. Um, that doesn't mean you're without tools. There are the federal tax incentives, which are helpful. Oregon has some specific incentive programs um, and support for solar and solar plus storage uh, and resilience that are growing. Um, there are, I think we're increasingly seeing the emergency management community uh, and FEMA and others starting to promote and support um, these projects. So yeah, we end up sitting down and uh, like I said, it's Frankenfinance when we look at each, each of these from the beginning. Yeah, I'll just add that I know, uh, you know, you all may be familiar with uh, PGE has a, a virtual power plant program. It's about 500 residential systems. So they provide rebates for, for battery storage. Um, that's a great start. We, we worked with programs, you know, that's how Basically, the Green Mountain Power Program works in a similar way. And Massachusetts has what they call a Connected Solutions Program. That's a demand response program. Um, so those types of revenue streams or upfront rebates, however it's structured, can really help make a difference in, in making the economics work for, for these projects. Great. We've got 18 questions. We've got a, a growing list. Um, so I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, which I'm uh, interested what your guys' perspectives are here. Uh, what is the likelihood of a solar home installation or potentially uh, any, any solar installation, right? Uh, remaining functional during an eight plus uh, Richter or whatever scale you're using seismic event like the Cascadia event might be, um, assuming that the home's wooden frame has been seism seismically retrofitted and attached to its concrete foundation. Uh, can you point to examples of systems that have survived cataclysms? Uh, excellent question, and I can't answer it for um, for residential. Yeah, that's um, a key part, I think, of, of what um, we uh, are looking to do with the, the work we're doing right now is to understand what needs to be involved to um, sustain a system. We focused on uh, commercial properties, existing commercial properties, and they have various levels of, um, and, and very often don't have um, seismic protection in them, particularly the older uh, properties. Um, so unfortunately, I can't answer that one, uh, that question specifically, uh, but it is an excellent one. Yeah, it is. You know, I could say post Maria, a lot of work went into looking at how you make solar systems, rooftop and uh, ground mount uh, resilient in, in hurricanes and serious hurricanes, category five hurricanes. Um, I don't think that it's been tested a lot at seismic events. I am aware of a facility in Salt Lake City, um, their emergency management building that does have solar that is, is set to be there for a major seismic event. It's certainly not a home though. So like, like Jack, I don't know anything on, on the residential scale. Great. Um, and let's see, this next question was about that as well. Uh, we've got a question, siting, permitting and interconnection costs have typically been high for commercial microgrids. What lessons have been learned on historical projects regarding these costs? Oh, we could. We don't have enough time. Um, <laughs> and those. Are, that's that's excellent. And um, I think very often what we see is a lot of people throw around. That was folks always want a rule of thumb. Like, how much does it cost per kilowatt to do this, or how much does it cost to this, that, or you know, how much does a microgrid cost? One of the biggest variants in the 
the cost of these systems, particularly when you're dealing in smaller scale commercial, is the cost of that interconnection. Um, because you, particularly when you're retrofitting, right, you have to go in and make adjustments to um, the way the building's wired and, um, you know, the panels and to isolate this, to isolate circuits. So you can find a project that is really easy and it's only a few grand to interconnect it and another one where it needs $50,000 worth of upgrades and um, uh, changes. So getting on the site, getting those site conditions down, really understanding what's in the panel um, is super critical to uh, understanding the cost and the feasibility of the projects. I get a little bit concerned when I see, you know, somebody, they, somebody typically comes with, oh, this solar, you know, vendor said it was, you know, here's a, here's a proposal to put solar on my roof and he's going to add batteries and it's going to be great without having actually checked to make sure that that's all feasible within the site conditions. So um, those are huge drivers and getting the right folks on the team early, pretty critical. Great. Um, so we have still somehow 14 questions. I think the number keeps going up. Uh, I think uh, let's go to 105 or maybe 107 or something. And then uh, if you guys are available to answer questions over uh, email, we can send the remaining questions out, uh, just some quick answers um, uh, in the email that's gonna go out also with a recording of this event. Uh, so we'll just go a few more minutes and thanks to everybody who has uh, showed up and, and been here today. So uh, this next question is, what publicly available tools do you recommend for analyzing microgrids? I think this is a question about the technical, if there are any maybe open source style tools. Yeah, there are. Um, National Renewable Energy Labs has a tool called Reopt that um, was one of the early um, design tools to look at microgrids. There is a uh, something called Reopt Light that is sort of more for the the first casual look at it. Um, the uh, there is a it's not publicly available in that you can get it for free. It is publicly available that you can go out and buy a subscription to it. Um, Homer, uh, which spun out of uh, the Renewable Energy Lab folks and now is owned by UL. Um, that is a tool that uh, quite a few folks in the industry um, use. There, there are a few other tools that are out there. Uh, there are a lot of proprietary tools that the major systems integrators have, you know, themselves. Um, I, I caution folks that um, the, the model is often only as good as the modeler. So um, it can be dangerous to go and and, and you know, to, to go and, and, and try to play around with the tools to make certain assumptions that can be pretty far off, even though you fed the tool data and it spat out a result, sometimes really learning how to tweak those is, is pretty darn important. Um, but those are good ones out there, just like, you know, folks have used you know, PV watts to get a really general idea of solar. And then anybody who has a lot of experience in it realizes when you go from that PV watts that you tried on your own and it's pretty cool into what actually works in the facility, it can be radically different. So um, yeah, those are, those are some of the big ones. Great. Um, we have a, a question here about vehicle to grid. Uh, which is an exciting uh, topic. I don't think we covered it all today, um, but any comments on vehicle to grid, uh, maybe also uh, wind, uh, and they mentioned Ambry batteries. So, um, I, I, I can go on, <laughs> yeah, I can go on, just a vehicle to grid. Um, there are demonstration projects out there. there there's nothing that I've seen on a wide scale commercially. Um, I, you know, it's been a while since I've looked at it closely. 
to check your, your vehicle warranty documents before you go doing any kits out there because um, some, some warranties say you can't use this um, for vehicle to grid or it will, will void your, your warranty for your car battery. Um, but increasingly we're seeing, seeing vehicle manufacturers that are looking at the capability for vehicle to grid. So I, I think that will play a, a role in the future. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say, you know, wind, some projects incorporated, we don't see a whole lot of small wind projects, but on, on larger uh, microgrids potentially. Um, and Ambry, I'm not sure what's up with the Ambry batteries now. It's been a while since so I looked at those. Yeah, get, nothing new and exciting. I think I asked a lot about um, wind and very, in, in, in almost every case, the facility that we're looking at with, with a few exceptions are so tight that you wouldn't be able to, with, with current sort of feasible technology, be able to get wind in there at the scale you wanna have. That's changing obviously as smaller scale winds getting in. Um, but we look at uh, a wide variety of battery technologies. Um, we try to, Focus, while, we, while we remain vendor and solution agnostic when we, when we do our analyses, we try to um, base the results on what you could get off the shelf. Um, and I think that's important in, in looking at, at some of these projects. Great. And uh, we, we're at 107, but uh, let's finish with one last question that I think is interesting. Uh, from Andrew, are there uh, pathways created for new technologies like flow batteries uh, to enter energy resilience uh, nonprofit space? Boy, I, you know, I wouldn't start with the nonprofit space because <laughs> it's, it's tough. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen some small scale uh, redox flow batteries that have, I've seen, I think there's an Australian company that does that, but I have not seen it adopted much the projects we've worked on in the U.S., people are always talking about flow batteries um, as the next thing, um, and they have they're able to potentially economically scale for longer duration applications. Um, just haven't seen that being that cost effective for projects so far. There are certainly projects out there that are doing it, but we haven't seen many. But Jeff, I don't know your experience. Yeah, no, I I'm a huge fan of. Um, what flow batteries can and, and do in certain places. Um, again, it's a, this is much a um, game of what it has achieved production scale and commercial viability as anything else. And when you're dealing with um, projects like, uh, you know, a lot of the ones we see, um, it is not always easy to be able to get as cost effective um, or available a solution from some tech, from some chemistries as you would from others. So um, I think the future is strong for flow batteries. Um, and we're going to see as, you know, projects evolve over the next few years, newer chemistries popping in that uh, a few years ago we wouldn't have been talking about. Great. All right, well, let's end here, but thank you so much, Seth and Jeff, for being here. Uh, really, really great to hear about the exciting work you guys are doing. Uh, and thank you to everybody who joined. Again, uh, we'll send out an email. We've got 11 more questions on the list. Uh, I'll see if we can uh, answer them um, and then send that out also with a recording. And we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks so much.